All right, so in Ephesians chapter 5, the part I'm going to be focused on is the, the, the latter portion of Scripture. There it talks about husbands and wives. And, um, you know, I was at a, a, a great wedding ceremony on Friday and heard a really awesome message on, it, it, you know, and the text of the passage from Friday was out of 1 Corinthians 13, which is, of course, the charity chapter. And it was, it was great to hear that applied to a marriage. You know, having charity, and, and, and I preached, you know, when we went through our First Corinthians series just not that long ago, through First Corinthians 13, and, um, you know, explained how, how important charity is, and charity is really just a, like a deep love, it's a, it's a caring love for, for someone else, and um, I thought it was an excellent application of the, the long-suffering and the, the kindness and, the, you know, the charity towards your spouse and towards your wife. So that got me thinking. I was like, man, you know, I, I don't know if I've, uh, I, I've had this idea for a long time. I'm preaching on marriage, but like I didn't do it because at the time I think I was already preached some other sermons and stuff. And I was like, well, it was just a few months ago. And I started looking back for my notes on this, on this sermon. And I was like, yeah, just a few months ago. I found this back in August of last year, so <laughs> it's been like a year since I wanted to preach this, and then it's been even longer, so I was like, wow, you know, I haven't hit on this in a while, and you know, the subject just of marriages in general, this is, the Bible overall is not very complicated, you know, our lives, we tend to make them very complicated, but as far as just obeying God and doing what's right and living a righteous life, it's not that complicated. There's only, you know, generally speaking, so many sins that we really have to be worried about and focus on. I mean, all sin is a problem. We have to worry about it. But it seems to be that there's always some common things. You know, marriages have problems. That's one area that we need to be focused on. You know, there's, there's other fleshly lusts that we need to be make sure that we're, is being hit regularly, you know, from, from church, from the pulpit. And this is one of those that when I actually look back, I was like, man, I haven't preached an actual sermon on this a long time. This needs to be covered. And, and you know, that hearing that sermon on Friday was excellent because it ties in perfect with the, the sermon that I've been wanting to preach anyways here um, and for, coming from Ephesians chapter 5. And the title is Husbands Love Your Wives. And I, I, I hope I haven't been too imbalanced, but when we oftentimes hear and about you know, wives being obedient to your husbands and, and being submissive and you have to obey your husband and all this other stuff, which is absolutely true and is important. And the reason why it gets preached on so often is because of our backwards culture today, is because of the feminist movement, because of all these things that have been completely fighting against the, the feminine woman's role according to Scripture. So that does have a tendency to get preached more often. But in the zeal to, to combat that you know, culture shift, we can't forget the husband's role of loving their wives. This is an extremely important, I mean, just as important as the other. And a marriage consists of two people coming together and becoming one flesh. That is two aspects, and, and, and both are just as equally as important to have as strong of a marriage as possible. So we're going to look at this, the, the aspect mostly, I mean, I'll probably touch on the wives a little bit just because we're talking about marriage, but mostly it's about the husband. So it's geared towards husbands this morning on loving your wives. And in verse 25 there, we see of Ephesians 5, the Bible says, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And that describes what, you know, what's already written in 1 Corinthians 13. You know, the, the, the mercy, the long-suffering, the charity uh, uh, that I heard about on Friday. And here it's explaining you need to be loving your wife as much as Christ loved the church and was willing and did, not just willing, but did give his life for it. Jesus Christ offered up himself as the sacrifice out of his love for the church. For people. And we ought to have that same love as a husband towards your wife. Now, as time goes on, it becomes even more important that you remember this. Because what happens to oftentimes in marriage is you get so used to each other that things become routine. You get used to having your wife, you get used to having your husband, and you, you know, maybe things are going fine or well, and, and, and you talk and, and everything else. But you might kind of forget and, and almost have a sense of taking your wife for granted. 
and just, oh yeah, well that's my wife. She, she just does all this stuff. And it's really important because a lot of problems will stem as a result from women feeling like you don't feel the same way about them anymore. Even though you probably do, the problem comes up when, you, when, when it just becomes too routine, when things just become too old hat, when it's just day in, day out, same old routine, and, then, and you almost start to treat each other with not as much caring, not as much you know, sense of love there. So this is something that is very important in a marriage and it can cause a lot of problems. Let's keep reading here though as far as because the first thing he mentions about husbands loving your wives is, is, is as Christ loved the church. Think about the importance level then that your wife has to have in your life. Think about the importance level that the church had in Jesus Christ's life. He says he loved that. I mean it was so important that he not only gave, him, gave his life for it, but did all the works that he did, you know, went through all of the suffering, all of the, you know, all of the persecutions. Everything that he went through was out of that love. So there may be times where, you know what, if you need to support your wife, you're going to help your wife, whatever it is that's needed to, to, to really be there and to give yourself for, it may not be easy. And oftentimes, when you're going through some things and it's not for yourself, oh, it's for my wife, you don't want that to breed resentment either. You know, I can think of examples where, um, you know, I, I'm not going to pick anyone else out. I'll pick, I'll pick on myself and, and, you know, situations with my wife because these things happen across the board with a lot of people. For example, you know, I've been, thankfully, thank God, I've been very healthy lately. But my wife hasn't. There's been instances where we've had to go to the emergency room. We've had to do things. And you know what? We don't, it's not like we just have a bunch of money sitting in the bank and we can just afford you know, to go down to the doctor and just, oh yeah, we'll pay for all this stuff. It causes a strain. And you know, anyway, everybody knows that <laughs> finances can cause a strain in a relationship. You know, just money and, 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 and getting everything to work and, and, and you know, Providing the food and, and what we, the things that we have. Now, obviously, we ought to not be that focused on money in general, and that, and that will help to relieve the stress that money can place on a relationship if we, don't, if we don't really care that much about it, if we care more about each other, we care more about the things of God, that becomes less of an issue. But that's a whole other sermon on, on our focus on money. We know that this can cause stress, so what we don't want to have happen is I don't want to have to look at my wife and be like, man, why couldn't you just take care of yourself better? Why couldn't you just do this? Why couldn't you just do that? Now I have to go and work more. Now I have to do all this in order to pay for these bills. You know, and, and you could see where real quickly that could turn bad as opposed to saying, you know what? I love my wife and no matter what we have to do, I'm going to make sure that she's taken care of. And if I have to work harder for it, so be it. That's part of what goes along with loving my wife. And it's that right attitude of having that, of saying, you know what, I'm going to take care of her because I love her just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. I'll give myself for him. I'll do what it takes. If I have to get another job, whatever it is that I have to do in order to provide for, in order to make sure that she's taken care of. And obviously her health is extremely important. I'm not talking about just getting like another car or getting a sewing kit or whatever else. You know, these, these financial little things or gifts. Hey, gifts are great, but um, you know when it comes to the you know the really important things of actually the needs and taking care of her, I will completely give myself for it, and I'll do extra for the gifts too. But that's not you know when, when we're thinking about this type of love of giving yourself for them, you know don't let especially financial matters or anything else for that matter. I mean your time away from from other work or other things that you got going on, you know don't let that build any type of resentment. And we're going to get to that actually. In, uh, I'll, I'll skip ahead here in my notes. In Colossians 3, which is a parallel passage, passage to Ephesians 5, verse 19 says, Husbands, love your wives. Exactly like we saw here in Ephesians 5, 25. But then the rest of the verse says, And be not bitter against them. Bitterness. We don't want to have that type of, of, a, of a feeling where we're bitter towards our wives. We need to love them and get rid of any bitterness. Any, any time where you know, your, your wife may have done you wrong, or any shortcomings and failings that they have because, look, we all have them. We need to have, if in order to have a successful marriage, if you want your marriage to last, if you want to be like these people who are having their 30, 40, yay, 50 year anniversaries 
and they've, they've stood the test of time and their marriage has lasted, you have to make sure that you are not allowing yourself to get bitter. There has to be a proper level of forgiveness. You have to be long-suffering. You have to have charity. You have to have that mercy. Otherwise, it's not going to work. It's easy to pick apart faults on people, especially the more time you spend together and living together, you get to see all of them. But how important really are those things? And most, most things that, that married couples have problems with tend to be petty. Not all. I mean, sometimes there's major issues, but a lot of the things that we do. And you have to be able to decide, how much do I love my wife? And if you're married, you know what? You got to decide, I do love my wife. And I will love my wife. And not just leave it up to a feeling either. You say, I want this marriage to last. You know, God has given me my wife. I'm married now. You know, divorce is not an option. And we're going to make this work no, you know, no matter what. This is going to work. And let's get down now to the next part here in Ephesians 5, verse number 26. Because besides Christ giving himself for it, it says in verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish, without problems, without spot, without, without these things, you know, basically and without sin, right? He died to cleanse and to wash, and now he could present to himself <coughs> a bride that's without spot. And part of the, judge, the, the, the husband's role is to help your wife to grow in the Lord, right? You give yourself for your wife, but, and look, in the head of the household, the husband ought to be leading, not just in financial matters, not just in, you know, how the house is going to be run, but spiritually also. And I've gone over this in the past, that the husband is to be the head of the household as well as, you know, spiritually as well as, as in other areas also. God has ordained you to be the leader of the house. And it's important to not just rule the house, not just be the boss, but to help your wife to grow. To help her to become, you know, as Christ did with the church, cleansed and sanctified and without spot. And... You know what? There's, there's times when a stern rebuke may be necessary. It happens. But that ought not to be the only way that you deal with issues ever. Having the proper love will mean you have the mercy and the grace that you will be extending as your spouse grows, as your wife grows in the Lord. That we, we need to remember for one, not everyone grows at the same pace. And as much as you may want your wife to be right up here with you, if you're up at, at some high spiritual level and maybe they're not as high, hey, you got to extend the mercy and grace. And think about this. Just think about your own self. How much grace has God extended to you? When you're evaluating, you know, your spouse and say, you know, oh, no, you need to be, you know, how much grace has God given you in your life and in your growth? And we need to remember that and think about that in our expectations for our wives as husbands. Because I know a lot of guys are, are probably similar to me. I mean, we're, we're just kind of real logical and just, just no nonsense. This is the way we think, do things. And you know what? This is the way it's just going to be done. And, and, you know, that's great and fine. But in a marriage, you know, you also have to remember that may, there's, there's going to be certain problem areas and you're probably going to notice them a lot more. It's going to be magnified as a result of living together. You know, whereas other people who are friends and people you don't just share a house with might have the same exact problems, but you don't see those all the time and everything appears fine on the outside. Everybody's got sins that they're dealing with. And when you're in, you know, in a household with someone, you see it all the time, you still need to remember to be able to extend the mercy. Now, I'm not just saying just accept all sinfulness, accept all these things wrong, but to be able to help. Help the wife to grow spiritually. Now, the wife is the help meet for the man, which is helping in, in, other, you know, in running the household, kind of keeping things in order and, and helping the husband to do the work that he needs to do um, by, by providing all of, the, all of the other things to be done at home. 
right? I mean, the husband shouldn't have to worry about, you know, making food and doing the laundry and everything else, that, all these things that need to be done. But in order to get the most work done, in order to go out and to provide and, and, to, and to bring, you know, bring home the bacon, these other things need to be dealt with. So that's the help meet for, that the wife is for the husband to help him to be the most efficient at his job. But the help that the husband gives the wife in this regard is to help spiritually, to help to teach, to help to grow and to lead. As a husband leading the wife and, and being able to present, you know, holy and without blemish. It's not just always about a rebuke. Like I said, it may, ha it may need to happen from time to time, but, but overall, you know, reaching out and, and, and getting to the heart of matters and, and being able to teach is also extremely important as a husband. It's part of your job to be able to, to teach and to help to grow. And having that done with that same love in your, with your wives. I mean, think about the way that Jesus Christ taught the church. Sometimes he ripped, right? Sometimes he laid it out. But many times, you'll probably find more often than not, he was teaching his disciples. Even when, when his disciples might have been in the wrong, look at the way that he dealt with problems. Look at the way that he dealt with his disciples in different areas. You know, they were completely wrong when they said, you know, Lord, should we have fire come down from heaven? And he said, look, you, you know not of what spirit you're of. And he explained to them, but he didn't just hang it over their heads, right? I mean, and, and you can look at other areas in scriptures too. I mean, when, uh, when Peter was saying, no, you're not going to go and, and be killed, right? He said, get thee behind me, Satan. That's a pretty strong rebuke. But... Look at the way that he treated him. He didn't hold like resentment or bitterness at him. He still continued to help Peter to grow. He still was explaining and teaching why it needed to be done. Right? And this is the way we need to keep that type of mentality where uh, we, can, we can lead and try to teach our wives in the, in, in the same manner of having grace and mercy and love while we're um, trying to teach them. Now let's go on to deal because you know most of the, most of the sermon I have today is going to be dealing with how to deal with with problems in marriage because problems arise and we want to make sure that we can have the best marriages possible so that they last forever and we can actually keep our vows that we made before God that says until death do us part that that we treat that seriously we think it's important and we know that Satan is trying to attack Satan wants to split homes he wants to split marriages up especially the marriages of Christians. You're going to be way less effective. You're going to do way less for God when you, if you fall into this trap of, of, of you know, marriages being split. It just causes all kinds of problems. Turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 3. And I'm, you know what? I'm going to keep reading for you because I didn't get through all the rest of Ephesians chapter 5. As part of the mindset of, of loving your wife, because it, he goes on to further explain in verse 28, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. You know, that's the type of, you know, how, how much do you care about yourself? How much do you want to, you know, do you, do you take care of your own health? How much do you take care of, of your own physical self? Well, you need to be having that same type of attitude and mindset towards your wife as well. You know, you don't, you don't hate your own flesh. You love, you love yourself, but you ought to be loving your wife the same way because you're one flesh. Verse 29 says, For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. And this is an important concept to keep in mind that the two have become one flesh. You are no longer two individuals. You are one. When you get married, when you have that marriage and you come together, you have to treat each other as part of the same body, as one person. You need to be on the same team, right? I mean, think about just your own individual body. If your body's fighting against itself all the time, how much are you ever going to get done in any area of your life? You know, if the left side of your, of your body is going like, man, you know, getting in fights and stuff all the time, you're fighting with each other, you're having problems. 
well, I want to go this way, I want to go this way. You're not, you're not going to get anything done at all. And, you know, it may seem kind of silly up here, but that's the way, you know, when a husband and wife are together and joined, you know, and in agreement and everything, that's, that's going to, you're going to do the most, you're going to get the most accomplished, you're going to have the most joy when, when, when you're in line with each other, as opposed to two individuals trying to separate that body of, of that's one, and always at odds and always wanting to go different directions, always want to do different things. Well, I want to do this. Well, I want to do that. And, and, and not treating together as one. Now, the, the husband is the head. You know, and the head makes the decisions. The head's the one determining where things are going to go. But if you've got another body part, you know, tell, you know trying to, to go against what, what the central nervous system is trying, is trying to tell it to do, then it's just going to cause problems. And that's, you know, again, that goes into the, the, the leadership that God has given unto the husband because otherwise you'd have two heads. You know, this two-headed monster where you've got completely different ideas of what's going on and that, that's only going to cause more problems. There needs to be someone with the final authority within the marriage. But he says here, I'll read it again, verse 31, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. That is God's plan for marriages. And as husbands, again, the title of the sermon is Husbands, Love Your Wives. We need to make sure we're loving our wives to the extent that you love your own body, and the extent that Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Turn, if you would, to 1 Peter 3. You should be there already. 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to start reading in verse number 7. Verse 7 says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. And again, I, you know, I, I've, this has been coming up kind of repetitively with this, this concept of honor. And I firmly believe that the word honor is not just referring to a respect. Honor is also referring to a taking care of financially supporting somebody or something with that honor. You know, children honor your parents when they get older. That's, you know, I, I've gone over this, I think, just last week. And here we have another example. Husbands giving honor unto the wife. You're providing for them, it says, as unto the weaker vessel. Men are built stronger. Men's muscles, men's stamina, everything about men is built stronger or built to last or built to go out there and work and to provide and to work hard. Men are built to not just be able to make enough for yourself, but to make more. God has given men strength and ability to go out and, and to produce and to make that for, for, for way more than just himself. Because that's the man's job. That's the husband's job. And to give honor unto the wife. And don't just be like, well, I know what I mean. I went to work today. I know what I'm eating. What are you going to do? Right? I mean, that's wicked. And that's not loving your wife at all to have that type of an attitude. Just say, well, good luck finding some food to eat. Maybe you need to go out and get yourself a job and, and make your own money. Pay your own way. That's wicked. That's not the wife's role. And, and you need to, to respect and understand that the job that she has is also important, but it's different than the job that you have. And you need to give honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. It says, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. And this is a really important concept, and it goes back together with being one flesh. It says, look, when you're dealing with your wife, you are both heirs together. Why are you heirs? Because you're both children of God. You're both born again. You're both saved. You are heirs together. In Christ, there is neither male nor female. In Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. We're an equal footing before Christ. And when we breathe our last breath, it's not going to matter at all whether you're male or female. He's going to divvy up rewards and, and you are both heirs. You have heirs of eternal life. You're on the same footing. So remember that Remember that this is your, not only your wife, but your sister. And have that type of mentality also as being heirs together of the grace of life. God's grace has been extended unto both of you. And you, you both together have that grace. And it says here that your prayers be not hindered. 
implying that if you don't keep that in mind and you are living where you're not, you're not remembering that your heirs together and, and, and having these extra problems as a result, your prayers may be hindered as a result. Verse 8, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing. Knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. And I think this is easily applicable, whether or not you want to say he's still talking to the husbands here in verses 8 and 9. It's the same concept. I mean, if you're going to be treating your brother in this way, how much more your wife? Being compassionate. Having the understanding that she's not perfect and is maybe dealing with certain problems. Having that compassion. Love his brother and says, be pitiful, be courteous. You know, as men, and, you know, we need to be able to, to watch our own mouths too in the way that we talk to our wives. Just as any boss ought to. Think to, think to yourself this. How much are you going to want to, even though you should, right? Think about going to work. And anyone who has a boss. The way that they speak to you. If your boss speaks to you in such a way that's just degrading, demoralizing, and just completely like just always just 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 treating you almost like as if you don't even have a brain. Now, is it still your job to listen to obey him? Absolutely. Of course it is, right? I mean, he's your master, you're his servant, you need to do, you know, that's the authority structure. But what's that going to do for your heart? Are you really going to want to give your best to that boss that talks to you in, in that way? And, and look, being a boss, you can speak to people with respect and sternly at the same time and giving orders and saying, look, I need you to do this. I need you to do this for me. You know, and, and it's not a question. You don't even have to, you don't even have to say thanks. But the way that you talk to people has a big impact. And as men, we need to remember that. I, I, myself included, this is, this is a big deal for myself on, on getting things done because we need to remember that we need to be compassionate in the way that we deal with our wives and speak with them. And then it's, it goes on in verse number 9. You know, that's where being courteous is there at the end of ver, you know, verse 8. I mean, courtesy. Verse 9, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing. So the times when, when things are said that shouldn't be said and get your blood boiling and you know, you get in those arguments, you don't need to go tit for tat. You don't need to respond. It, it, maybe your wife's in the wrong and she says something nasty and says something mean and, you know, and, and, just, and just, just attacks. The, the proper way to deal with that is not to attack back. You can deal with that issue or whatever was said and, and respond to what was said without going on an attack. And, you know, and that goes for husbands and wives because everybody's guilty of this. And when you respond with evil for evil and railing for railing, all that does is escalate the situation and make things that much worse. It's never going to help. When you, when you come back with another burn, with another, oh man, but you did, you know, and, and, and you go back and forth, when has that ever just solved the problem? I, I've never had that in my experience in dealing with anybody. I've never had that just all of a sudden, hey, everything's great now. It's fixed. Actually, it usually just tends to more hurtful words being said that, that oftentimes you wish would never, never come out of your mouth. And this is probably one of the most difficult things because when emotions come up, you have, a lack, you have a lack of wisdom and, and, and keeping that filter in your mouth, but we need to try to remember that and work on that and, and be able to stop ourselves before continuing to escalate. And it says here, but countrywise blessing. Try doing that. It's not easy. But the more you try to do that, and you know what? It's going to start off because I've already, I've already done this. Anytime I've, you know, when I've gotten in arguments with my wife, 
and, and sometimes if they've gotten any bad, I haven't come out and blessed her like right away. <laughs> but what I'll do is, you know, separate and I'll pray to God and I'll bless her. And that is a good start. And when you are praying for somebody else, when you're, pr you know, and look, pray for your wife, pray for your wife every day. That will help to keep the love there, the proper emotions and, and, and feeling towards your spouse. Pray for them every day. You're, I mean, it, no one has to know about that. No one has to see that. I've never even told my wife that, that I've done that. But it helps you to have the proper love for your wife when you can just go and say, you know what, God? You know, especially if there's times where I've thought that she was wrong and I say, God, you know, forgive her. And, and bless her and help her out with this and help her understand, you know, whatever, and, and give a blessing. It will help your marriage. It will help your life to have that proper mentality and approach towards your spouse. And it will it'll eliminate a lot of problems. And hopefully you can get to a point to where, you know, the evil for evil, over railing for railing, you actually are able to just give a blessing right there. And think about the level of, of diffusion that will do to the, to, the, to the situation and to really just de-escalate what's going on. And obviously, it has to be sincere because if you sound mocking, <laughs> it's only going to be that much worse. You say, bless you, honey, you know, or something where it's like, you know what I'm talking about. That is not the, the type of blessing that you need to be giving where you're, where you're gritting your teeth and, 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 and you're trying to, to dig it in there a little bit more. But it's truth. And, 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 you know, and this, is, this is truth from God's word. We need to, to try to keep that in mind. Now, I don't ever recommend separations. I was talking to someone recently um, just on, on some marriage counseling and advice. And um, you know, separations, I believe, just lead to divorce. I think the worst thing that you can do when you have problems with your spouse is to is to separate. Now, I don't mean separate like like within the house like for for an hour or whatever because you you know like you're kind of pent up anger. I mean separate like I'm going to stay with my mom. I'm going to go in a hotel or whatever. I have never allowed that in my house even when things have gotten, you know, rough. No. We, and you know what? I say we're going to sleep in the same bed. I don't care if we're angry. I mean, this is, it, it, is not, it is not a good idea to start thinking that separation is the answer. Terrible idea. Because then you're going to start to think that you get used to it. You know, and the more it happens, the, more, the easier it's going to be then to separate and say, well, I'm just going to go here and you're going to go there. Oh, hey, look, things seem to be working out great now because we're not fighting, we're not arguing, because we're not even by each other. And then you start to get in your head, well, the separation seems to be working. Why don't we just make it permanent? Leads to divorce. Terrible, terrible, terrible way to deal with it. Anytime you think, well, I just need to get away. Okay, get a little bit of space, for, like I said, for an hour or two or whatever, but like, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. The Bible says, you know, be angry and sin not. If you do have a righteous anger towards your spouse, don't, you know, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. Be able to put it to rest. Be able to put it to bed. And be able to, to spend the time, you know, where, where you say, you know what, we're still, you know, I still love you even though we're angry with each other and we're going to get through this. It's It's important. And just as much as I don't believe in that separation, I think spending time together, if you are experiencing any type of problems or any types of issues, make it a point. If you notice things as like a husband, because again, this is more geared towards a husband. If you notice there's things that are just not going that well, you seem to be having more problems, more fights, more you know, things, make it a point to spend time together. Make it, make it important enough to you to say, you know what, I don't like all these problems. I don't, spend more time together. You think, well, we're going to fight more. No, no, no. I mean, spend good quality time together. At first, you may still end up, you know, if you're having a lot of rough you know, times and stuff, you might still have some problems. But put forth the effort to spend time together. I'll give you a little wisdom on women. Women need to hear that you care as well as feel. They, they need to hear about it as well as feel it that you're physically attracted to them. 
That, that you, and again, this goes back to my, to my comments about just kind of getting used to each other. Getting used to just, oh yeah, it's my wife, oh yeah, you know, and, and getting old hat. Women need to have, it, it's, it's part of how God made them. They need to feel love. They need to know that you actually look at them and are, and, and are satisfied with them and, and you, you know, your heart still pounds for them and, and that you still love them. And they need to hear it, but not just hear it, they need to feel it. You need to be able to express that in a way where they know that, you know what, I still, I still am, am attractive in my husband's eyes. It is important. It is very important. And the physical, turn if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. The physical relationship in marriage is an important one. That one thing is probably, and I, you know, I don't have statistics on this, but it's probably the leading cause of divorces is the lack of a physical relationship. Couples not being physically engaged with each other. And 1 Corinthians 7, we've gone over this in the, in the study, but we're going to look at it again, goes over this, this need. And, 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 it, and it goes over, um, you know, it's definitely a very strong need that, that many people have. Not everybody does to the, to the same level necessarily. I mean, the Apostle Paul was unmarried and, and he calls it, we're going to see here in 1 Corinthians 7, it's, a, it's as like a gift of not needing to, to, to be with someone, to be married to somebody, or in order to avoid fornication. But let's, here, let's, let's, let's start reading here. Look at verse number 1 of 1 Corinthians 7. Bible reads, Now concerning the things where he wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. So that's good. You know, men and women, just, just don't touch a woman. Prior to marriage. This is what it's talking about. Just men and women, prior to marriage. You know, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication... Let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. He's saying, okay, look, it's good for a man not to touch a woman, but, you know, if you have this urge, if you have this desire, you definitely don't want to be committing fornication. You definitely don't want to be engaged in this physical act with somebody outside of marriage. He says, if, that's, if you feel like that's, that, that's something you want and that's something you want to do, get married. Great! Get married. Now it's all good. You can completely avoid fornication and you can have that desire fulfilled. Look at verse number 3. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. Remember this is the title, Husbands, Love Your Wives. We're seeing that again here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, except this time it's going to be in a slightly different regard. We saw it, we saw it in um, Ephesians chapter 5 as Christ gave himself for the church. We saw it in, uh, in uh, for the first or second Peter chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3. And we're seeing it again here in 1 Corinthians 7. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. This is talking about, in the context here, we started in verse number 1, a man touching a woman, having the physical relationship, and saying that, you know what? In this area, and I know the man is the head of the household, the man's the one that makes the rules, the man's that's in charge, the man's dictating what things are going to go. In this one aspect, the Bible says that, you know what, you don't have power over your own body. And likewise the woman. This is saying that when you get married, having the physical relationship, you don't have the power to just say no and to refuse. As it says in verse number 5, defraud ye not one the other. You're defrauding by holding back because one of the reasons you get married is saying, hey, I want to avoid fornication. I want to avoid having this physical relationship with someone who's not my husband, someone who's not my wife. So in order to do that, I'm going to get married. And when you're being withheld from having that relationship, well, now you're being defrauded. And now it's going to be like, well, what am I going to do now? I mean, I got married so I could have this relationship and I could have it rightfully because in the marriage bed is undefiled. But now it's being withheld. He says, The only exception is defraud you not one the other, except it be with consent for a time. Consent means both parties are consenting to it. Consent meaning, yes, okay, honey, yeah, we're, you know, we're going we're gonna to not have this relationship for a set time, for this time. Why? It says that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. Fasting and prayer, not just prayer, 
Fasting and prayer. Fasting is when you withhold food from yourself. Right? You're not, you're not eating anything. How long can you go without eating? <laughs> I mean, I know Moses did for 40 days and 40 nights. That was a really long time, but that's like the longest fast recorded in the Bible is, is a 40-day fast. Okay. Typically, fast lasts a day, three days, maybe a week. Maybe a week. That's not very common. I've never fasted for a week. Just being honest, never fasted for that long. So when you're consenting to not defraud each other, to give yourselves a fasting for prayer, and come together again, it says that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. When you're not having the physical relationship, Satan will try to tempt you. Because Satan, look, Satan's out to defy, divide. He's out to destroy. He wants to ruin marriages. And he knows the way that humans operate and the physical desires that they have. And God has given us a way in order to have this type of, of um, relationship and have it be righteous and holy and pure. But when you're withholding that, Satan will come in to tempt for your incontinency, for you not having that relationship. Now let me add this. What I'm teaching here about the importance of physical relationship is all true because it's extremely important to have that relationship and you ought to be having that relationship. And again, this will help with, with the, the love that you have and, and being able to express that love towards your spouse and show that love by having that physical relationship. It's only going to be good. It's only going to keep you bonded together and, and as one flesh. Literally and metaphorically, I mean, you're going to be, that's going to help strengthen the marriage. Having that relationship is only going to be a good thing. But while all of that is true, if you are in a situation where that's a problem, you should never use that as an excuse to do or even think wickedly. Satan is the one that is tempting for the incontinency, but don't use that as a justification as saying, you know what? Well, my husband or my wife's not giving me this, and, and you know what? Then that's fine. That's why I'm going off and doing this other thing. That is wicked. That is wicked as hell, and that does not justify anything. Now, if you're a wise husband, if you're a wise wife, if this is, a, if this is what's happening, you ought to try to, to, to rekindle that relationship and have that physical relationship in order to prevent anything from happening. But if anything is happening, it's wickedness. It is pure wickedness, and it needs to stop. The Bible says that adulterers deserve the death penalty according to God's law. And Jesus even said that if you look on a woman and lust after her in her heart, you commit adultery with her already. Now, I'm not saying if you commit adultery in your heart that you deserve to be put to death. But I am saying that Jesus said that you're committing adultery in your heart. And that's wicked. And you know what the next step is going to be if you're committing adultery in your heart? It's just going to be the real thing. If you've already got it in your heart to look after other guys, to look after other girls, to look after you know, other people, to, to, to try to go outside of your marriage and to look for things, that's going to be the next step. When you allow yourself, and sin works that way for all sin. When you start making allowances just in your mind, you start, usually the sin always is going to start up here and in here. That's where it starts. You think about the things before you actually do them. I guarantee you, if I were to ever go back into my old sins, for example, drinking or drugs or something like that, it won't just be me just, just happening, oh, hey, look, here's a beer, picking up and drinking it. You know where it's going to start? It's going to start with me thinking about it. It's going to start with me lusting after it. It's going to start with me thinking and justifying and in my head, prior to ever even going through with it, well, it's really not that bad. Well, maybe these guys have a point. Oh, well, maybe Jesus did. You know, and, and whatever the process may be, whatever the justification is going to come from, I'm going to be thinking about it, and I'm going to be lusting after it and desiring it in my heart before I actually follow through with doing it. And it's the same way with adultery. People are going to be thinking about it. Things are going to be going through the head. They're going to be justifying it. Well, my husband, well, my wife, they don't care about me. They don't love me. They don't, we don't have this relationship. So I need, you know, I just need to have this need satisfied. I just need to find the love from someone because I'm getting sick of this because I'm not, I don't feel loved and, and respected or whatever. 
That's where it starts. And if you notice that ever start to happen, and I don't care what's going on in your marriage, when that starts to happen, that is wicked, and that is a sin, and there is no justification to have those types of th thoughts. And that is Satan tempting you. And like I said, spouses, husband and wife, be wise and try not to let things get to that point either. Because as much as it's wrong, as much as it's evil, those things happen. And like I said, it's probably the leading cause for divorce is the, the relationship fizzling out. Physically, emotionally, not having that love felt there anymore. Things get old. Yeah. That's just my wife. That's just my husband. Let's not have that type of an attitude. And if, if you're feeling that way, hey, do something about it. How important is it to do to you? you know, your spouse ought to be a high priority in your life. I'll give you an example with my priority list. My priority list is number one, God. God's first. God deserves the first in, in everything with our life. But you know what number two is? My wife. My wife is number two. You know what's number three? My children. You know, people often say, like, everything's for the kids. You know what? My wife becomes before my children. That's my priority. You list your priorities what they are. My wife is number two in my life, only to God. My parents, my brothers, my, you know, my children, no, they all come after my wife. My wife is the, is the number two priority in my life. Then my children, and you know what? Then the church. If I have to take care of the church versus take care of my wife, I'm going to take care of my wife. If it, if it comes down to a decision where the only thing I can do, I have just this choice or this choice, and I have to choose between you know, my wife being taken care of or the church, you know what? I'm going to go with my wife first because she's at the higher priority. And if it comes down to my wife or God, I have to take God. That's the priority. Okay. Now, what we want to do is have them all... <laughs> being handled and dealt with and loved and, 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 and taken care of all at the same time. It's great. But we need to have the proper priority in our life. And you know what? Come up with your priority. But wherever that priority is, if it's really a priority, then it, you have to be investing the time and the care and the, and the resources into that. It needs to be coming there. And, and you need to be willing to invest the time to something so important. Now, if you're someone that has a crazy, busy schedule like I do, there's things, you know, doing all this different stuff, you need to be sure to make time for your wife. And this is important, and this is something that I had to do recently because when it, when it came up in, in our marriage, I had to decide, you know what, you know what, no, my wife, my wife had some, some issues and there was valid points and valid reasons that she wasn't feeling loved because I got so busy, because I was just doing all this other stuff. I'd say, you know what, you're right. And, and I answer, you know what, we have a date night. And there's going to be time that's just set apart. And you can't let other things get in the way. And you say, you know what, we're going to spend time together. And we're going to do this because you're important to me. And, and I value my wife. So, like, I'm setting time apart for God, right? I'm going to church three days a week. I'm going soul winning. I'm, you know, reading the Bible. I'm definitely setting time apart for God. But you know what? I, and, you know, I'm also setting time apart for my children. There's times I'll set apart to take them to the parks, time to set apart to go do this. I better dead sure make, you know, make sure I'm, I'm setting time apart for my wife also. They're important. It's really important to maintain a proper relationship to keep that time together. Now, you might ask yourself, well, how do you manage serving God and pleasing my spouse? And this is great. One of the great ways of doing this, because you can do both at the same time. You can do a lot of things that, that coincide together. And one great way to serve God and to please your spouse simultaneously is to incorporate your wife into your service for God. For example, um, one of the ways that I do that is we re I read to my wife. I read the Bible to my wife and I read the Bible to my kids as a family. We have a family Bible time. And that is good, wholesome time being spent together. And I'm reading out loud to them while they listen. And, and that is a great way to even just to spend a little bit of time together. Going out soul winning. 
We did this for years. So, I mean, even as we started having kids and stuff, now it's a lot more difficult. But we still, whenever we get an opportunity, if there's a grandparent in town or someone that we trust with our children, which is very, 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 very few people, if that opportunity arises, we'll go out soul winning together. And it's great. I mean, you get to spend time here. I mean, think about how much time for everyone here has gone soul winning. You get to learn about other people. You get friends. You go out. You talk to each other. Why not spend some of that time with your wife? You can help each other with Bible memory. As you're around now, doing chores, doing things on a Saturday, or your day off or whatever, you're at home. Help each other with that stuff. Another great, great thing to do with your wife is to set aside time for prayer. You need to set aside time for prayer anyways to God. Pray with your wife. Pray out loud together. You could be praying for each other also. You know, that's also going to help. As I mentioned before, you know, when you get in those fights and you pray for your wife, well, if you're not even in a fight, but, you're, but, but every night is part of your routine and praying and you pray out loud, your husband, your wife's going to hear that and they're going to know that you're thinking about them. You're thinking about them so much, you're praying to God. And some of the things that they might have thought that you just overlooked or you weren't listening when they said that or whatever, you know, and, and you, you just are kind of, you just don't even know what's going on. If they hear you praying that, they'll know that you're listening. They'll know that and they'll feel much more appreciated and loved at that point. All great things. You can keep service to God and incorporate your spouse into that and it's a great time and will only help your relationship. One last point for the husbands. You need to do what it takes to make your marriage work. As important as it is to live peaceably together and extend mercy and grace, and it's extremely important, and that ought to be the overwhelming theme of, of loving your wife. There's still times that you may have to make a decision that is not well received for the benefit of your marriage. Now, the most common that I've seen, and it's actually been more common among newlyweds, people who, are, who have been more newly married, or maybe among people who are more newly saved that have already been married. The, the biggest problem I've seen is the bad influence from other people. And this is something that ought to be recognized, and hopefully it could be recognized without you husband having to enforce some kind of a rule. But you know what? Sometimes it comes down to that. There are people that are extremely, you know, maybe family, it may be friends. Whatever it is, if someone is known for giving bad marriage advice, like you should leave your husband, you do not want your wife around a person like that. That will never help your marriage when they're getting marriage advice or marriage advice saying, don't do what your husband says. You need to stick up for yourself. You need to, to, to put your foot down. You need to, you know, that is not 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 biblical advice and it will never help your marriage and if there's people that you know about that you need to limit or abolish the time spent with those people when i had that problem and i'm not gonna get specific on it i just made sure that when we're around certain people i have to be there all the time at least until the problem ceased at least until that was was you know gone away that and that's it's the way it worked it's the way it is and there's other people Nope. You need to cut the phone calls. You need to cut the, you know, whatever it is. It's not good. It's not helping the marriage. It's not good at all. You need to be, turn if you would, well, you, you go back if you would to Ephesians chapter 5. You need to be on the same page. You are a team. You are one flesh. So you need to be treating each other, you know, and, and, and this is a good way to stop those types of things, but sometimes it's not always easy. And again, when people who are newly married or newly saved, you know, oftentimes, and again, especially in situations where the husband's much more spiritual and much more uh, developed spiritually and, and the wife is much younger, the wife might not be as strong to say something or might be more easily influenced as Eve was by, by the serpent into coming into these types of thoughts and have, you know, and being influenced of, of, oh, well, I need to stand up for myself. Or, oh, I need to, you know, and taking this bad advice. And as a husband, you need to be able to recognize that and restrict that influence on your spouse. Because like I said, you say, yeah, but it's a family member. It doesn't matter. It's not going to help your marriage. You are married now. 
You know, you've left, you know, the, the woman has left her father and mother. You have left your father and mother. They are no longer the ones telling you what to do. You don't need to worry about their, you know, like, like their rules or their opinions even. You are now need to worry about keeping your marriage together. And that authority comes from Ephesians chapter 5 as one of the places as a, for a husband to do that. Ephesians 5 verse 22 says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. In all matters, in everything. Just as much as Christ is the head of the church. If Christ lays down a rule for the church, the church has to obey it. I mean, that's the bottom line. It's in everything. When the, when the husband lays down the rules for the wife, it's in everything. And at least everything that doesn't contradict God's rules. And having contact with some friend or family member does not break any of God's rules. It doesn't. There's no commandment that says you have to speak to someone who's trying to split up your marriage. For sure. So the husband has, a, um, has the authority to do that. But you always ought to be on the same team. And for all those that are married, husband and wife, if you have someone that tries to convince you to leave your spouse or talks, even talks bad about your spouse, let's say they're not saying you're know, trying to get you to have a divorce. When you're around people that's talking bad about your spouse or makes fun of them or doesn't respect them, that's bad. That's going to rub off on you whether you realize it or not. It's going to have an influence on you. You better be awfully quick to defend your spouse. Even if things aren't going well in your marriage, it's even more important to say, you know what? No, don't talk that way about my husband. Don't talk that way about my wife. People ought to be afraid to come to you with some criticism of your spouse that's, that's just like, you know, trying to tell you how bad they are or something. You ought not to tolerate that or accept that. You ought to be quick because you're on, you are, as much as you would defend yourself, you ought to be able to defend your spouse. You are one flesh. You are, you are together for life. That is important. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this great teaching from Scripture, dear Lord. I pray that you please help the, the husbands in this room, dear God. Help us to have the, uh, the proper love that we ought to have for our wives, just as Christ loved the church, dear Lord. Help us to um, love our wives and have the physical relationship that we know we ought to have. And um, Lord, we, we pray that you would please just give us the wisdom to rule the house well, to rule with mercy and long-suffering and kindness and meekness and gentleness, dear Lord, but also to um, be able to spot problems or areas that need to be dealt with, dear Lord, that are not going to be helpful for our marriage because our marriages are extremely important. We, um, we want to have a good testimony as Christians. We want to be able to show the world that, hey, we're different. While the world may be going out and divorcing half the time or three quarters of the time or all the time, that we don't do that. We don't live that way, that we have respect for your word, we have respect for our spouses, and that we are going to stay true to our words for better, for worse, dear Lord, until death do us part. God, please give us the wisdom. Please give us uh, what we need to be able to, um, to have the proper love for our wives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.